Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on January 31st. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The model list is in the video description. The missions for this episode mainly revolved around putting satellites into geosynchronous orbit, starting with Baker Knot's TDRS satellite seen here. But there are also two other launches to geosynchronous orbit that I was tasked to do by viewers. And there was also the matter of the Halcyon pod still in orbit around the Earth. And I had fixed up the antenna that was broken so that we could restore communications with it. But anyway, here I am preparing Baker Knot's TDRS satellite. I decided to launch it on the Kingfisher launcher, which you see here. And of course this has the M1 with the sea level configuration at the bottom and then a J2X as the second stage engine. I decided to add some boosters to it and these are actually NK33 boosters just to give us some more margin. Uh, getting to geosynchronous orbit isn't the easiest thing. Actually, it takes less fuel to get to the moon than to actually circularize at geosynchronous orbit. So it is a little bit tricky. I wanted to make sure to recover those boosters with stage recovery, so I did put real shoots on and configure those parachutes properly. But uh, there you have it, NK33 boosters. Unfortunately, I had to reload the game before launch, so I decided to show a flyby calculator that somebody mentioned. And so this is, I, I don't know exactly what it's called, I think it's just a flyby calculator or something like that on the forums. Anyway, you can see me trying to plot a Earth to Jupiter to Pluto run, and of course we had trouble launching a Pluto probe before, so I was very interested in swinging by Jupiter to get to Pluto. There is a Jupiter transfer time coming up, and so you can see the chart of the plots, you can see the, the transfer windows very distinct in that plot there. Okay, here we go with the launch, and we are flying out of Kourou in French Guiana this time, because there's supposed to be a geosynchronous satellite and Kourou is at a very low latitude, launching out of Cape Canaveral would not be good in this case and I am trying out my KOS script. Little did I know that the KOS script does have a peculiar problem with launching out of Kourou in this case, and you'll soon see, soon see why. Okay, so ignition. And here it starts wiggling. And it knocks the launch clamp that's uh, attached to the second stage, which is high. And that takes out one of the boosters. And KOS tries its best, but the problem was that the launch pad at Kuru is not angled at 90 degrees. It's not doesn't have the same heading, if you will, as the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. And so I didn't realize that when writing the KOS script. I thought they were all oriented 90 degrees, but in fact it wasn't. And so the KOS script tried to turn the rocket immediately to 90 degrees, and that caused the problem. And, uh, well, I decoupled the other booster in hoping that I could stop it from rocking around, but obviously that didn't help anything. And eventually I had to abort. Well, I can't actually destroy the rocket, so I just have to do it like this. Anyway, it would have taken quite a long time to actually wait for it to explode, since KOS was doing such a good job trying to keep it upright. So here I just removed the second stage clamp. But I haven't fixed the problem with the script. So it's still going to try and turn to 90 degrees. But then the problem is that KOS on its own, unless you have some sort of feedback, feedback loop in there, uh, if you just leave it to the baked or cooked controls, I forget what they call it, um, it overcompensates and keeps rolling back and forth if you allow it to roll like this. It doesn't do roll very well. Handles pitch is fine, it's just the whole roll thing that it's just not very good at. So you can see, eventually it dampens out, but it's a slow process. It just overdoes it, it keeps going back and forth. It actually keeps rolling much longer than I expected it to, and I think maybe I should have tuned down the gimbling on the NK33 engines. Given this problem, though, with the subsequent launches from crew that I'm going to be doing in this episode, I don't use the KOS script anymore. I decided to just take it up on my own with Smart ASS, of course. This is a little bit ridiculous, but uh, here we go for booster separation. Oops. 
Well, I had actually configured the boosters to separate using smart parts, and the smart part was configured to separate the boosters when it went to 0% of the liquid hydrogen, no, sorry, the liquid oxygen. Unfortunately, the liquid oxygen, as you saw there, never went to 0% because it had 0.07 left, so I had to stage it off manually. Okay, there we go. Set. And the ignition of the J2X, the M1 reads vapor in the feed lines, shut down. I don't know why it was trying to restart anyway. But, well, curiosities on top of curiosities sometimes. Fairing separation, and there's our probe. Still rotating. Now, there's no way this is gonna stop the rotation. It does have RCS on it, but that's apparently not strong enough to stop this rotation. So, as we extend solar panels, it ends up looking like that. Well, as long as it gets to the target destination eventually. But first I'm going into low Earth orbit because I want to make sure there's an adequate gap between this and the geosynchronous satellite I already have up. Here's the check that the boosters were covered, and indeed they were. I believe the terminal velocity it said was 2.5 meters per second, so that's excellent. And here we're getting close to orbit, and we will see where the KOS script can at least turn off the second stage at the right time, or close to the right time. And there's the result, 326 by 236. Uh, not exactly what I set it for, but again, that tends to be where it ends up anyway. So, here I am plotting to get the, get the satellite out to 35,786 kilometers, which is the altitude for geosynchronous orbit. We don't really have to adjust the 5.7 degree inclination that we get from launching out of Kuru. If we did want to adjust that, of course, we would take care of that at Apoapsis. Anyway, there goes the J2 stage, and uh, now I have to decouple. Of course, this has the unique situation where this can re-enter and sort of save itself. It's got parachutes and a heat shield. Unfortunately, its periapsis is currently out of the atmosphere. And if we wanted to lower that, we would have to do an RCS burn at Apoapsis. So rather than taking time on that, I just uh, let it go, another piece of space junk. And I turn to the probe with its continuing burn for 35,786 kilometers. So plenty of Delta V as you can see there. I think the probe has some fuel locked, so it actually has much more Delta V than it says, but I don't intend to use the probe's own fuel, I just I will just use the fuel from the stage I built to get it to its target destination. Alright, here we go, I use RCS to boost it to the, well, close to the right number, and out it goes to Apoapsis for the circularization burn. There you can see the huge web of our communications. I turn that on just so that we can see everything at work because we are boosting our communication capabilities so it's just nice to do that okay so uh, checking that the fuel is settled of course these are the advanced Gemini lander engines they do require ullage and all that basically they're taking the place of the one kilonewton thrusters they're basically overgrown one kilonewton thrusters to my mind anyway here I've gotten it to 23 hours 56 minutes and 4 seconds which is what you want for geosynchronous orbit keeping in mind that the uh, uh, you have to take into account the amount that the Earth goes around the Sun. Alright, uh, somebody had requested that I explain the stuff in FAR, the, these FAR analysis numbers. I didn't do a particularly good job. I'm not really good at explaining these derivatives. And uh, I tried to demonstrate, this is a special install I use for aerodynamic stuff. It's uh, in 64-bit. It's actually a realism overhaul install without Real Solar System. Technically, Real Solar System isn't required for Realism Overhaul anymore. It used to be, but it's no, no longer under the required mods list. Uh, so this is just a special thing I use to test aircraft, and uh, it allows me to use clouds and visual effects so that I have a better time flying things around. And of course, I have B9 Aerospace, which is you see there. Uh, to fit all the plain mods that I like, I decided to uh, well, not have real solar system, which has those huge textures for the planets. So yeah, anyway, here I, I tweaked the plane so that uh, we got the derivatives all green. You saw that I 
And actually, the last piece of the puzzle, a uh, viewer suggested tilting the wings up a little bit more in order to fix that particular number, so I got some viewer help. But yeah, as far as explaining the far derivatives, basically what I discovered was that, well, what I already knew. I'm not very good at explaining it, that's why I've never done a far tutorial, and I'm probably not going to do a far tutorial. I'd have to brush up on a lot of things before I had the confidence to do that. I did get to test out the Saber Engine, this is the large Saber Engine of course, that comes with the B9 pack, and it seemed to work pretty well, though I had a little bit of trouble, I didn't put air brakes on this thing, so I had a little bit of trouble getting it back, and decided ultimately to abort trying to land, you can see I can't even line up correctly, I'm going so fast, 180 meters per second still, that's more than 360 miles an hour, not a good landing speed. So I abort and I try and see how fast this can go instead. So going back up. And of course this burns liquid hydrogen, which is a little bit inconvenient. Uh, in air breathing mode it just burns liquid hydrogen. In rocket mode of course it burns hydrogen and oxygen. And it's got ethanol as a payload. So it's got a payload in its bay just to test that out. But I had trouble getting it uh, through the transonic region. It's not really breaking forth into the higher Mach numbers. And part of the reason is what you see here, this transonic design. And the more wiggly the line is, the less smooth these lines are, the more drag is produced when you're in the transonic region. And that blue one is of course the worst of them. Uh, the pointy nose does not help, really. The pointy nose is generally a bad idea. Pointiness, sharp edges, are not favorable, and this has a lot of sharp edges on it. So yeah, a bit of a fail on my part altogether, but I went straight back to the Soul System Colonization install, and here we have the World's Finest Disco Ball by Dialer Root, another geosynchronous satellite for communication, long-range communication this time. I topped him, I, I couldn't resist with the World's Finest Disco Ball to present the Galaxy's Finest Disco Ball. Uh, I, I felt that this was a little bit more akin to a disco ball, and uh, in fact the antenna at the top really sells it, I think. Uh, of course the lights, once they are turned on, will... And, uh, and actually the rockets at the bottom are tilted so that... Uh, those are one kilonewton thrusters, so that it does spin. And has a whopping 6,663 meters per second, because it's basically just one huge, huge fuel tank. Uh, almost five tons there. Anyway, this is another geosynchronous satellite. This is the Silver Bullet communication satellite from Bluegill Bronco 2. And uh, we decided that the thing to do... Oh, by the way, the antenna at the top is missized. It's supposed... It was bigger in 1.0.4. And for some reason, Realism Overhaul shrank it in 1.0.5. Uh, we ultimately fixed that, but Bluegill said to just change it with a different dish for now. Anyway, we decided to launch both of them at the same time, as you can see, so I'm trying to figure that out. I ultimately put an oversized tank for the World's Finest Disco Ball. And the second stage, I made three Vinci engines, which I hadn't used before, Vinci engines. Uh, if it's Leonardo da Vinci that they're named after. They're basically more powerful RL-10B2s. They have basically the same ISP, 465 ISP, I think. And they have those uh, extending nozzles, so uh, that's pretty neat to see. Though I find out that it's also a little bit tricky to remember to wait for that. I initially put two RS-25 spatial main engines at the bottom, but I go with just one, and then two Ariane boosters. Uh, so yeah, that seemed appropriate since we were launching out of Kuru again. So here we are. So it's sort of like like an Ariane rocket, except instead of with the Vulcane engine, you replace it with the with the spatial main engine. And here we have ignition. And of course, normally the upper stage on the Ariane rocket might have eventually one one uh, Vinci engine or Vinci engine, but uh, here I have three because I'm an impatient person. So off we go. And in fact, even I have a little trouble figuring out the roll out of this place. So I'm actually controlling it manually with Smart ESS, but trying to figure out exactly what angle I'm supposed to be going at is a little bit tricky. But eventually I get it, and so we're nice and flat. 
Lately I've been moving towards using the engines from the SSTU Labs mod pack, even though the mod pack is really huge, it's like 140 meg megabytes. But uh, the benefit is that it allows for engine clusters that just have one part, so you can have five engines together and it's just one part, and then you can customize that. Uh, I even have 14 engines I think they have in one cluster. But uh, also, as you see, the boosters separate there, slightly off-kilter. Um, it also has tank bottoms that have integrated RCS, so you don't have to put four RCS ports. So that's four parts that you can save on. It has the RCS built in, so that's pretty good. So uh, I'm hoping that some of the new rockets that I have, as that separates, and you can see this is a cluster of three engines, that's just one part as well. These Vinci engines, and um, I actually did not wait properly for the nozzles to extend. I had accidentally pressed spacebar again because sometimes the spacebar doesn't take during uh, real solar system launches, so I have to press it again. But thankfully, the next stage was just the fairings and not something more critical. Anyway, here we go, getting close to orbit, and we will have some fuel left over in this stage. They can relight, thankfully. But here we encounter an interesting glitch. I have throttled down uh, to zero, but it still seems to have thrust. 540 kilonewtons worth of it. And so that's actually a bug that they fixed in the latest realism overall. So that's fixed, don't worry about it. But uh, at this point, it was not fixed. So on I go after relighting the engines. And getting close to when they will be finished. There we go. Alright, so next we have to be a little bit careful. We've got two probes to deal with and I wanted to separate that one fairing so that I could extend the antenna on the world's finest disco ball just in case I forgot to get its communications up before separating the probe at the top, the, the silver bullet. So here I turn to the Halcyon capsule that we were supposed to test last time but we lost communication with. I fixed that problem by fixing the Kurz antenna in the Tentaris pack which had a bad re um, remote tech configuration for it. And so now that it's fixed we do have communication. Remote tech was confused by that antenna configuration, that's all. And I started to deorbit it according to the instructions of Aaronim, who is the, the viewer who made this particular system. And we got to 77 kilometers, and then got ready to ditch the service module. Okay, there we go. Alright, service module discarded, and now it is ready for re-entry. The tower at the top is to make a soft landing on the ground. It's actually retrofire rockets for that purpose. And uh, here we are entering the atmosphere. It does not look like we're going to hit the ground as we are passing by Florida there. We are definitely headed into the Atlantic. Unless we hit the odd Bahama Island or something like we did with Moon Chaser. But uh, yeah, it turns out that if we had adjusted the periapsis just a little, we might have actually landed really close to Cape Canaveral. But that's alright, here we go. And Aeronim had adjusted the ablation on this capsule, and so you note that the ablator is melting away quite significantly. And so that was very interesting. Uh, according to him, uh, in his install it didn't ablate quite so much. We got pretty close to... Uh, pretty close to zero in this install, so there there is variation and all that. But yeah, I've been complaining in my Realism Overall series and, and in other places about the fact that the blader doesn't seem to ablate very much. Well, it seems like uh, we might have a tentative solution for that, at least with this capsule. Alright, well, through the worst of it, it did hit some high g-forces, and it is pretty close to the end of its ablator but otherwise it seems to be in good shape. And here we're getting ready for parachute deployment. There we go, parachute deployment is good. Those are some big parachutes of course. Main parachute deployment. And I decided to test that retro rocket just out of curiosity. It didn't do what I thought it would do. 
I mean, it's not very powerful at all. Uh, there's a little bit of lag as we splash down. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you can take a look at the Delta V melting away. I thought it'd be much more forceful to slow this thing down. It seems to be more interested in rocking it back and forth, but that might be because of the physical time warp that I was using. So that was 3x physical time warp, and still it wasn't producing that much thrust. Those are supposed to be SRBs, by the way. So, yeah, a little bit odd. But, anyway, here we are, back with the silver bullet, and... I'm going to get this up to geosynchronous orbit in a different location as my existing one and the one that we just put up the TDRS satellite. So actually the gap between the TDRS and my previous geosynchronous satellite is about 120 degrees so I decided to have this fill the third gap uh, 120 degrees from the other two. Now that means that the world's finest disco ball well, doesn't really have a neat place to be put in geosynchronous orbit, but I'll deal with that in a second. So here it is, it does have good power and I get it to 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds and now it is in fact time to deal with the disco ball. You can see the the way things are placed right now. Yeah, so I pondered this and I decided that the place to put the finest disco ball will be in a polar orbit. Now there's no particular point to putting a satellite into a 23 hour and 56 minute polar orbit, I don't think. Uh, there might be some spy-ish reasons, but but uh, yeah, for my purposes it was just a matter of symmetry. And so I separated from the Vinci stage, or Vinci stage, and start getting it on its way. Now the only reason we can do this, this is a pretty sharp departure from the plan, and the reason I can do this is because the world's finest disc ball does have some delta V of its own, substantial delta V of its own, so that it can make the correction, correct its inclination once we get to apoapsis. So there we go, a high apoapsis. I use RCS to fine tune it, and then we head out. So yeah, this has been a ComSat episode of Soul System Colonization because that's what viewers submitted, but again, I pleaded with them to submit some other stuff and I have come up with a cunning plan. I've developed a rocket to land stuff on the surface of Mars and I've uh, given them the opportunity to get stuff landed on Mars for the same price as putting it, uh, same strut price, strut is the in-stream currency that I use, uh, of getting it into low Earth orbit. So hopefully that will be a good incentive to develop some rovers or supply vehicles or stuff like that. Anyway, off goes the transfer stage but we still have a thousand 152 meters per second left to do, so I use the internal fuel of the world's finest disco ball. Okay, so control from there, and those are definitely one kilonewton thrusters using Aerozine and N204. Takes a little bit of time, but we finally get it to 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds again. And now it is time to discover. Dialer Root's surprise for us with this probe. Remember in the previous episode we saw a probe, a space telescope that talked to us. He designed that and so Dialer Root has another interesting design for us. But I don't think I got it quite right. Working quite right. Not as he intended. At least he said it wasn't as he intended. Uh, so I did something wrong. He had a he had a washer in between the two sections and I think the disco ball portion of it was supposed to be rotating a lot faster than this. So yeah, I think I goofed somehow. Anyway, uh, but yeah, there it is. So that was the the hijinks in Soul System Colonization on January 31st. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.